Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of King of Commercial Real Estate with Dolph the Roos. Thank you so much for coming over, Dolph. Hey, Maitri, good to see you today. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about one of the different types of real estate that are, th are out there, um, and it's the multifamily buildings. Are they considered commercial real estate or not? Well, it's a very interesting thing here in the United States, especially when it comes to doing an appraisal or evaluation or when you come to doing financing, it is considered commercial real estate. However, I have a somewhat different view of what constitutes residential versus commercial. And I know sometimes my definitions are very complex. Like, <laughs> let me know if you follow this definition. In my world, mm -hmm. in my mind, residential real estate is real estate that people use as residences. Mm -hmm. And commercial real estate is real estate where people conduct commerce. Now I know there's that little gray area category of commerce being conducted in homes, but we're not talking about that. So in my mind, if residential real estate is where people have residences mm -hmm. and commercial real estate is where people conduct commerce, then an apartment building is large scale residential. In fact, we've spoken before about the residential tenancy agreement as opposed to a commercial lease document. In apartment complexes, the tenants are subject to a residential tenancy agreement. And all the rules and regulations that refer to single family homes, such as in California, if you don't pay the rent, you as landlord can't do anything for 90 days, that applies to apartment complexes as well. So in my mind, I tend not to consider apartment complexes as part of what I would call commercial real estate. No commerce is conducted there. It's not an office. It's not a retail store. It's not a storage facility. There's no commercial lease. Gotcha. Um, but I'm happy to talk about it because for many people, they consider you know, apartment buildings to be in that category of commercial real estate. Gotcha. So tell me, what are some of those types of buildings uh, that we can talk about today for that are considered multifamily? Well, I'm not sure what the definition is. We have single family homes, which by mm -hmm. definition, obviously, are just a freestanding single family home. Then you've got duplexes, which is two units under one roof and a triplex. Mm -hmm. I've heard of that. I've heard of a quad um, or fourplex. Um, I haven't heard of a quinplex or whatever, <laughs> but I guess they exist. I mean, I know they exist. You've got six uh, under one roof, but I've never heard of the expression hexplex or something. <laughs> That's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so you've got all those different categories. I don't know at what point it becomes multifamily. I suspect it's more than four, so five and above, but it could vary by region too. Gotcha. And tell me, what are some of the um, advantages and disadvantages of having a multifamily building in comparison to a commercial building? Oh, I, I thought you were going to say the advantages or disadvantages of a multifamily compared with a single family home. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about that first, because okay. the obvious big advantage of a multifamily building is you've got economies of scale. Mm -hmm. So usually the cost per door, as it's called, the cost per unit, will be lower than for a single family home. So if you get, I don't know, a 10 plex, a, a 10 unit multifamily home for a million dollars, that's only 100,000 a unit, mm -hmm. only being in quotes, of course, that's whereas right. a comparable single family home in that same area might be 150,000, say. So it's just cheaper per door, per rental unit to buy it as part of a multiplex. Um, the commensurate downside, of course, is that you attract a different kind of tenant. They mm -hmm. tend to be more itinerant. They tend to be younger, not as stable, not married, no kids generally, mm -hmm. although there are many exceptions. Um, so you have a higher turnover of tenancies. You get more complaints as the landlord or the manager. Can you get those people in unit number two downstairs to turn their <laughs> stereo down? It's eight o'clock and I go to bed at eight o'clock on a Saturday night. And what do you do? You call them and say, it's only eight o'clock. It's not even 10 p.m. What are they worried about? Or it's not even loud. Mm -hmm. You get all kinds of complaints like that. These neighbors, they've got three cars and they're taking up our space. We mm -hmm. need space too. You know, we've only got one. We should, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. I feel like that's a really um, big con uh, disadvantage of having like a, a multifamily building. You have to deal with the tenants, but that's not the case in the case of offices, for example. So tell us more about offices. In the case of office space buildings, first of all, what defines a, an office space building? Oh, an office space building is quite simply, it's a commercial building that tenants use for their offices. So the staff tend to come there at eight, nine in the morning, could be earlier or later. They work there, that's where they run their business, but come closing time, whether that's five or six at night or earlier or later, they tend to go home. No one lives there at night. They run their business there. Mm -hmm. And is there any way to turn um, residential real estate um, 
property into an office space. Oh, gosh, that's very interesting because you've hit on one of the most lucrative things you can do. Ooh. As an analogy, if you get the inside scoop from a company that they're going to do a merger and acquisition or they're going to divest themselves of a division and you buy or sell stock in that company based on that tip you got, that insider information, that is a criminal activity. That's called insider trading. Oh. And people go to jail for that. Oh, wow. Whereas if you go to a city council meeting, you sneak into the city council meeting, <laughs> and you hear that they're talking about making Robertson Road, I'm making up the name, changing the zoning from residential to light commercial so that houses can now be used as an accounting office or a law office or maybe a hairdressing salon or maybe a wine bar or something like that. And you act on that information. You buy that house in anticipation of that zone change. There's no law against that. In mm. fact, you don't need to sneak into the council meeting, as I said. You can just turn up as a bona fide member of that city. Mm. I don't know if the member's the right word, but you know, I mean, a property taxpayer. Or you can employ someone else to go to that meeting. Or you can watch the meeting online, live. Oh. There's no concept of insider trading when it comes to zone changes with mm. real estate. So one of the best things you can do is find out where there will be zone changes. And when you think of it, most cities in this country and most Western countries, they didn't start off at a particular size. They started off a smaller little trading post or something 150 years ago. And as they grew, more and more of the inner core had its zoning change from residential to commercial. So it's happening all the time. And we've done this often. We've seen that there's going to be a zone change. We buy houses, which might rent at, I don't know, $1,500 a month. And then you turn it into a hairdressing salon or a wine bar or a, a, a back office for an accounting firm. And suddenly it's worth 2500 a month. Oh, wow. And the wear and tear is actually less because they're not there 24 hours a day. They're not sleeping there. They don't have baths and showers and steam and all that. It's just pure office. That's so, yes, right. that is a very valid thing that you can do. And, oh, and interesting. And the cool thing is that we actually have access to that information then when all of these zoning changes are happening. Oh, absolutely. It's all public information. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And um, another of the terms that we heard uh, was also a central business district. Can, what is that exactly? That's sort of a generic term for the core part of a city where a mm -hmm. lot of the business is conducted. Okay. So many cities... They have a core bit where you've got higher rise buildings than in other parts of the city. Like I live in Phoenix, which ironically is the fifth largest city in the mm. country. It's got a surprisingly low number of high rises. I think it's only mm. about 20 or so. <laughs> and because land is so cheap in Phoenix, we tend to go out rather than up. Mm -hmm. we, you can drive for 100 miles and still be within the greater metropolis oh, wow. of Phoenix. Whereas Vegas, which is also a very high growth city, Las Vegas, it is limited. It's got BLM, which is Bureau of Land Management Land and Indian Reservations and the lake, Lake Mead and the like. So it's stopped being able to go out and it's now starting to go up. New York City, Manhattan, it's got a lot of high rise buildings. They ran out of land and they go up. So the CBD refers to that core part of the inner circle where you tend to have a higher prevalence of high rise buildings. It's where all the major firms are, and the law firms and the accounting offices. It's got the central core. The police station is usually somewhere near the Supreme Court, the High Court, you name it. Oh, interesting. And um, now speaking about the different types of buildings that we can have in, in the case of office space, what are some of those types that we can get into? I know that there's class A, class B, class C. Can you explain us more about it? Sure, they're not always very um, definitively defined um, classifications. A class usually means it's got the latest technology. It usually means it's got a certain minimum number of elevators per floors or floor plates um, so that you're not left waiting very long. It's got the most modern lighting system there is. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, our requirements for lighting change. Mm -hmm. I remember when we all changed from incandescent lighting to what was called CFL, mm -hmm. compact fluorescent tubes. Mm -hmm. In fact, the local electricity companies and cities throughout the states would give us financial incentives mm -hmm. to make the switch. Oh, well. well, now no one wants to go to CFL. Now it's all LED lighting. That's right. And so things evolve, and therefore what qualifies as grade A versus grade B versus grade C also evolves and changes. But grade A means it's it's the latest of modern facilities and equipment and ability to air condition a building, which means conditioning, both heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. For some reason, sometimes 
air conditioning is sort of is cooling and uh, HVAC is considered heating. But it's, if it's reverse cycle, which a good grade A building will have, you can heat in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, mm -hmm. It's got certain classifications of elevators, certain speeds, certain capacities so that people aren't left waiting. That's right. And I believe that it would also depend on the um, not only the type of building, but also the type of tenants that you would get into those office spaces. Am I right? Well, you tend to attract a, you know, a, a better kind of tenant to the grade A building. Mm -hmm. So your, your modern um, smart law firm will tend to occupy grade A space because that's the image they want to project and they need bigger space. They've grown so that that's where they end up being. Not in all cases. Some are very mm -hmm. happy with a more classic looking mm -hmm. feel of the building. Um, but in general, yes. Yeah, so you get a better kind of tenant in the great, but they cost a lot more too. Oh, interesting. So wh how much more does it cost then? Well, it's hard to put a number on it. It depends on the city. Mm -hmm. The difference in price between a grade A building in New York City versus Phoenix, for instance, or Seattle or Boise, Idaho, just to pick mm -hmm. cities at random, is going to vary wildly. Um, but in general, grade A is more expensive than grade B, and grade B is more expensive than grade C. But at the same time, you also have, uh, with all of these different types of buildings for office space, you also have the chance to have different type of law firms or different businesses that would be also willing to pay the mortgage, am I right? Well, they, if they own the building themselves, then mm -hmm. by definition, they'd be paying the mortgage. But generally, with I think what you're getting at is with grade A building, they're more expensive to buy, but you get a better kind of tenant who's willing mm -hmm. to pay higher rent, which as the landlord would enable you to pay the higher mortgage. That's so right. yeah, absolutely, that, that's so how it works. What are some of the tenants that we can usually see on an office space building, and why do you like these type of tenants? Well, I can tell you why I like commercial tenants as mm -hmm. opposed to residential tenants. <laughs> Um, and there are many reasons for that. One we've touched on already in some of these podcasts. With commercial tenants, they earn their income on the premises. So they have a vested interest in keeping the building looking good. Often they'll come to you and say, listen, in the lease it says that if we want to paint the building, we have to get your permission. Do we get your permission to paint it? And I say, yes, of course. And they're going to make it psychedelic pink with purple <laughs> polka dots or something. But they, they want it to look good. I've never had a residential tenant say, man, I like this house so much. Do you mind if I paint it and I'm going to replace the windows with dual pane windows? <laughs> and No. If anything, they ask you to do it and they, they insist that oh, wow. you do it. But in the case of a uh, commercial building, uh, the tenants would be the ones responsible then for paying all of these um, different modifications to the house? Well, that brings us to a, a very interesting point. So when it's minor things, generally they do that without asking. They just mm -hmm. want it looking really good. So they'll put a new sign on it. They'll replace this. They'll fix that. They'll paint it. But there is a clause in most commercial leases which says that the tenant has the right to ask the landlord to pay for an improvement. Mm -hmm. And if the landlord agrees, then the tenant shall agree to paying extra rent based on the value of the improvement of X percent. And X is usually filled out at the time of signing of the lease. Mm -hmm. Why is it a variable? Because as the economy changes over time, so that percentage changes. So I had a tenant and they had a 24-hour convenience store. And the front facade of this building just had a relatively small window and a narrow door. And they called me one day and they said, Dolph, do you think it would be possible to tear down this front wall and we want to replace it with this glass curtain? And then when people drive by, especially at night, they can see it's all lit up. It'll be clean and inviting and we'll get a lot more business that way. And I said, sure. And they said, well, would you mind paying for it? And so I said, well, how much will it cost? And my jury, it was a staggering $100,000 to tear down that front oh, wall. Wow. And I said, well, you know that there's a clause in your lease that means you'll be paying 6% on that. And they said, yes, we're happy. We think it's going to generate a lot more than $6,000 of extra revenue. So we're happy to do that. So here was the deal. I had to pay the $100,000. They would pay me $6,000 extra in rent. Is that a good deal? I feel like it would be because like uh, over time it would just pay all the amount that you spent on the... On well, the it's course. a 6% return. That's mm -hmm. not bad. But here's the beauty of it. When you mm -hmm. spend money on a building, usually the value of the building goes up by more than what you spent to make that improvement. Mm -hmm. So after replacing this front facade with a glass curtain, I got an appraisal done. 
And the appraisal came in at 200,000 more. In other words, by spending the 100,000, the value had gone up by 200,000. So at that point, I went back to the bank with this new appraisal. And I said, Mr. Bank Manager, I've got a new appraisal here for $200,000 more. Will you lend me a modest 50% of this increase in value? Mm. Well, banks are in the business of lending money in return for an interest rate. So they said yes. And they were charging me 4% interest. So here's the choice you have with the scenario. And it's all answering your question, what about Mm -hmm. if the tenant says, will you pay for it? So I could spend $100,000 of my own money and get $6,000 a year extra income, which is a 6% return, Mm -hmm. not bad. Or I could spend none of my own money because the bank put up the money and get no longer 6% because I had to pay 4% interest. I was collecting 2% on the bank's money. Hmm. Didn't cost me a thing. And at the end of the day, Marjorie, ask yourself, what actually went up? Well, did my collateral go up? Yes. Did my equity go up? Yes, I spent 100. The value went up by 200. So my equity went up by 100,000. Did my rental go up? Yes, the gross rental went up by 6,000. My net rental went up by 2,000 because I had to pay 4,000. So, so far, everything's gone up. Can you think of one more thing that's gone up that's probably the most valuable thing? The of value all? of your building. The value of the building went up by 200,000. Probably your equity, I would say. Equity went up. The most valuable that thing, thing that went up is my tenant appreciation. Oh, that's Can you imagine him going to his friend saying, holy smoke, I don't know who you've got as a landlord, but I asked my landlord to spend 100,000 stinking dollars putting in this glass <laughs> curtain. And for some bizarre reason, he smiled and said, okay. He spent 100000 on my building, and I only have to pay him 6% interest on it. If ever you're going to rent a commercial space from someone, make sure you rent from Dolph. Can you see how everything works in our favor? That's right. And I feel like by having that reputation of being a really good landlord, it also attracts more people to your business. Exactly. When you have another building, they're going to be like, Dolph is a really good landlord. I want him as a landlord. Right. That's really cool. That's exactly so. So uh, what are some other of the benefits that you see of having, in this case, for example, an office building? Well, um, for one thing, the leases tend to be longer. Typical lease lengths on residential are a year. Typical lease lengths on office buildings and many commercial buildings is measured in multiple years, five years, 10 years, and usually there are rights of renewal. Now, to be very pedantic, the rights of renewal are for the sole benefit of the tenant. The landlord can't say, you have to invoke your two-year right of renewal. It's for the sole benefit of the tenant. But ironically, when banks see rights of renewal on a mortgage application, they tend to think it's worth more than that same building without a right of renewal. So leases tend to be longer. We've covered the fact that tenants tend to earn their income on the premises. Um, Another one we've touched on is there's much less government interference. So when it comes to residential rentals, the government sticks its nose in. There are rules and regulations as to what you can or cannot do if the tenant doesn't pay the rent. In some parts of the world, in the Netherlands, if you can squat in a residential building for six months, then you can become the owner of that building. What an incentive to break the law and somehow manage and finagle a way of staying in a building for six months. That does not exist with commercial real estate. With commercial real estate, the government doesn't really stick its nose in at all. It's whatever is in the lease, that's what goes. Interesting. Um, Another difference is the management overhead. The calls you get from a residential property are astounding. You'll get a call from a tenant saying, my toilet's blocked, bring a plumber in. And you say, that's the third time this month. What are you putting in there? And they say, (laughs) none of your stinking business, no pun intended, bring the plumber. Mm -hmm. And... You call the plumber and say, okay, it's blocked again. And he says, how about tomorrow at 2 p.m.? So you call the tenant. How about tomorrow at 2 p.m.? No, I've got a doctor's appointment. How about Thursday at 10 a.m.? You call. You're dealing with people. Whereas with commercial real estate, office space or whatever, firstly, most commercial leases say that the tenant shall maintain the building in the same condition as it was when they acquired it. So if they were to call you, they don't. But if they were to call you about a blocked toilet, you say, well, was it blocked when you got it? Well, no. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have to fix it. They know that, so they didn't even call you in the first place. Um, It's just easier. So the management overhead is so much less. And here's a fundamental difference that really is a, a combination of all these things. 
residential real estate largely is a people-centric business. Mm -hmm. I know there are contracts involved, there's the residential tenancy agreement, but you're dealing with people, with plumbers, with people who mow the lawns or fail to show up to mow the lawns, and then you get a call from a person, the tenant, who says, the lawns haven't been mowed this week, and now dogs are putting mm. dog do on the, you know, <laughs> give it. you're dealing with people. When it comes to commercial real estate, fundamentally, you're dealing with contracts. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there are people involved in commercial real estate. The tenants are people, the lessees. The, the broker is a person. But in general, everything revolves around that commercial lease document. So it depends on whether you want to deal with people on a daily basis or want to deal with a contract once or twice a year. It's just easier to manage. And I feel like it goes way smoother because all the parties involved understand that there's an agreement and they have read the agreement and agreed to it as well. Right. And, and they earn their income there, so they just want to get on with their business. Whereas when they get home from their business where they earn income, that's when they want to pick on something about their <laughs> residential <laughs> landlord. What can we complain about? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Dolph. And that really gives us a really good insight on office buildings. And if we ever want to invest on that, now we know who to contact. All right. Thank, <laughs> thank you, so, you much. so much, Dolph. And thank you to our audience. And stay tuned for our next episode.